you all and uh, thanks professor uh, selina for inviting me i will make a very brief presentation on some of the recent works what i'm doing in computer vision and that is a very interesting domain where we try to try to see how networks right can we are, play an useful role in video analytics so so let's move on so what is deep learning i i think most of us here uh knows a bit about deep learning because this is the uh this is the buzzword in in machine vision or also in the other domains right but to but to give a very very brief overview of what is deep learning deep learning means that how we try to try to generate the feature space build the feature space from a very low level feature space right we go on using the filters which abstract the features right and fill and this filters are applied in layers right it is it is simple like suppose we want to summarize a book right how we should go we can we can just first of all we can read the words of each page right and then we can summarize that page right and then we can go through each of the pages of a chapter and then we summarize the chapter right and then we and then we actually make a summarization of all the chapters and then we summarize the book so the so the same way same way we move on from the low level features to the high level features and and we try to make it very easy for the classifier which is there at the, okay, at the end of my network so that it can actually understand in the very complex uh, scene what i have offered okay and that's the that's the exactly that's that's a very similar the, the, the way the human brain also works so the term deep network is basically two or two okay has two uh, two meanings okay one meaning is that it is a deep network uh, means it has number of layers right so that it can go from a very low level abstraction to a very high level abstraction right and the other other is that it can extract a very very deep uh, deeply seated information what we offer right and that's the that's the beauty of the deep networks and these deep networks are basically based on this on this convolution filters right which uh, which which abstract the features at different layers this convolution feature this convolution filters have a very uh, we can just derive it from our conventional neural network where we have the weight multiplied by the inputs instead of simply weight multiplied by the inputs in the convolution neural network what we do we try to define a size of a filter right and we try to define a dimension of a filter and and that dimension of the filter doesn't order on the entire image but it works on the on the patches of the image so that it can try to tap the the features which are spatially located co-located features and that's that's the difference between the neural network where we uh, uh, where we actually offer the data at one shot but in the case of convolution neural network we we apply this filters okay at the at the patches of the image and that's the way we try to abstract the in the feature space now if we if we look into this right we see there there are multiple multiple operations apart from the convolution filters right obviously there is something called the activation layer where we try to uh, Okay, try to push push something with a higher value with a higher level of activation and we try to uh, try to push out okay the other values which are which are not not above a threshold or which are below a threshold okay the other part of this is a subsampling which is done by the max pooling layer but the subsampling actually tries to compress the image and we are and and when we go with uh, the entire image this is a subsampled subsampled image it means that we are actually going from the very uh, uh, very specially specially collocated collocated features to the gross features of my image right and that is also done so so initially we will see that the filters works on a larger dimension but as we go higher up the filters works in a in a smaller dimension because this uh, Okay, these filters, uh, so that we can actually have a subsample space, and we can move from the 
very low level features to the gross features of the image, right? And that's that's done by the max pool. And once we have it done, then we can actually make a make a simple neural network classifier at the end, right? Which can which task is very easy to to classify it because because all the high level features are now available. And based on the high level features, the classifier can the classifier can easily take a decision. Now, now if we look into and that actually identifies or classifies the levels of the particular given image. For example, we started with a with an image of a room, right? And we can label it either as a living room or bedroom or kitchen or bathroom and, and so on. Now, if we look into the video, right? What happens in the video? The video uh, the video offers another dimension, which is the dimension of the time. So so instead of the information represented by a spatial distribution of x, y, in a video, we have a distribution of x, y, t, okay, where we have the, the t in an increasing, increasing direction means we are adding up the multiple frames of the video. Now, why video is important, right? Video is important because video gives Kyoto dynamic information in a sim, right? Image offers a static information, but, but in a real life, right, when you are moving in a traffic area, you're okay your automated car right requires the video information because it is moving the the the, the objects are changing with time but right? the image frames are changing with time in the in the in the robotic vision also to, to try to try to work in a real environment you have to analyze the video sports analytics which is one of my core domain i will come to that later in my, in my presentation right and obviously in the medical imaging also nowadays a lot of lot of uh, video analysis are being done because a lot of non-rigid, non-rigid analysis of the body organs are done. Okay, there are a lot of non-rigid body organs, right? To analyze those when you cut the video. So, so in a video, what we try to understand, we try to understand an extra feature, which is a temporal feature, right? And the temporal feature is that how much an object information changes with time. Okay, so so this is a very simple example for a. For a by which we say that object object which are located right in a particular uh, temporal interval t minus one, and the same objects have shifted okay, in the time t, right? And this is an extra feature which get added, which gets added in the video information, okay? And and so this feature also we have to we have to extract if we are trying to trying to do the video analysis using our deep networks, right? So, but there are there are something that the information doesn't always changes due to the actual object change. Okay, that is the object changes the position. It's not always due to that. The object information can change because there's a change in the brightness. Okay, you have captured the captured the minus one frame in one particular brightness condition, and you have captured the frame T in the another brightness condition. So then, obviously, as the brightness values are different, so it will it will find there is a change, a change in the object information with time. But that's not the object doesn't change; it's due to the uh, brightness. Okay, we neglect small motion. So, so this we normally neglect, right? We, these are the special cases we have to handle. But uh, but due to the limitation of time, I'm not getting into those details. Okay, those complex cases here. The other other assumption is that you have a small motion. You don't you don't have a very very large motion because if you have a very 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 high speed motion you require number of frames the more number of frames in a particular video so normally a video works very fine between 20 frames per second to 35 30 frames per second but if you are trying to trying to track an object which is moving very fast you have to go at least in a 60 frame per second or 80 frames per second then the processing processing becomes a very tedious uh, task and there are special techniques to do that okay that are those are also not considered in the normal cases of video analytics okay and the spatial coherence it means that if you are moving an object the object moves as a whole okay it is not that a sort of non-rigid object where the object one part of the object moves in one direction and the another part of the object moves in another direction so those things are again challenging challenging things okay so, so if you look at the data sets there are a plethora of data sets with which you can work they are they are on the normal image normal videos sports videos there are different types of youtube collection videos and there are also some videos which are specially for your movie scenes okay and there are plenty of that you will see that in every every two months or three months uh 
the researchers uh, make uh, make a data set of the videos and they upload it okay for the for the public research for our research purpose right and that's a fascinating things to work okay so what we will look into here is that it, it, that was, I will not get into the details of this, but this is a concept called spatiotemporal fusion, when we try to do video analytics. Why it is? Because the spatio means we are doing the image, which is a spatial distribution of intensity, right? I is a function of XY. Along with that, we are also taking a temporal path, okay? Because I, XY also changes with time, right? And that's and that's a temporal path. So so the way we can do is the, is the, Okay, is a phenomenal work was first proposed by the uh, 3D convolution. This was a phenomenal work which was published in the IEEE transaction in 2013, where the where the author said, "What is a 3D convolution?" So, so what we are doing, the convolution kernels and the and the the information were all 2D initially. What when we speak about the CNN, okay, fundamental CNN, it's a two-dimensional. So we try to try to augment that 2D CNN concept by the 3D CNN concept. What we try to do instead of one, one particular image, we put a bunch of images. So what do we have? We have a volume of images. So the kernel which was working on, on a single image will also be a volume kernel. Instead of a two-dimensional kernel, the volume also becomes a three-dimensional kernel, okay? because the other dimension is the time. Right, and similarly, all your convolution outcomes are also volume outcomes instead of this, right? And ultimately, we have a number of frames, okay, in a temporal domain, which defines the uh, de defines the outcome. So, so if you see that uh, in a particular three D CNN, you will see there are a lot of in the, in the, the feature space. Feature space is quite extended compared to a two D CNN. Right, and that's one of the one of the cost. Uh, okay, uh, the the issue of the cost which comes in the three D CNN. Okay, there is also another technique which is called a two a two scale convolution model. So, so this follows the principle of our capture what we do through our eyes. So in the eye we have a we have a region called fovea, and the fovea region cap captures the central part of the scene, right, and the rest is called the uh, the, okay, in the context, okay, which actually takes the everything in the in the particular scene. So, so the central part of the scene has the most important features by which we try to identify the objects, right? And the entire part of the scene actually takes the takes the average information. So, what do we do? We try to take the central part of this the central part of the frames as one stream, and we take a subsampled. Okay, this is a subsampled, uh, uh, subsampled uh, stream of the of the frames as the other stream, right? And we try to try to push two networks, right? And try to abstract the features, right? From the from the phobia stream and from the context stream, and ultimately there is a fusion. We generate a single feature space coming out from the two feature space, and we try to put the classifier there. Okay, the other important uh, contribution here lies in the in the in the work in 2014, where they define two separate streams. One is the spatial, one is the temporal. So spatial stream was being taken as a center image uh, given a set of frames. So we try to do the same CNN, okay, of the central frame and try to abstract the spatial features from the particular frame. Whereas the temporal, the temporal stream tries to work on the optical flow information between a multiple stream, a multiple frames which are taken in that particular stream. So there is a spatial flow and there's a temporal flow. And again, the two features from both the temporal and the spatial gets, gets fused. And ultimately the classifier can get started with both the features, uh, features, uh, the club features, and they can classify it well. Okay. So these are some of the some of the very well defined techniques to handle the video analytics. Okay. So there are many more. Okay, I can I can speak about five, six, seven, eight more, right? In the, in the latest publications of CVPR and IPCV and the, and the transactions of pattern recognition. I will not continue further due to the limitation of time, right? I can go on and on, but, but what I mean to say is that what's the next level? Okay, the next level is understanding the context, not only understanding the objects in the particular image, uh, okay, in a particular video scene, we are trying to understand the context. The context means that what is the interaction between the two objects in the video? What is the existence of the what? What is the temporal 
temporal existence of the two objects, right? And and then that will be a sort of a sort of cognition, okay, which we can which we can generate through our machine vision. So so correlation between objects and right and trying to and trying to generate the context of the various objects in a given video, right? That's the uh, that's the direction we are moving ahead. Okay, and that's very interesting. Some of the interesting works in this direction, okay, is localization, right? You have to you have to localize, you have to do a co a co segmentation type of approaches in the video, and and those will lead to this type of extraction of the video data, right? And recent papers on ICCV, CVPR, and transactions, you will see they are moving in this direction, right? You can you can tell that oh, this is a sin which is taking telling about this, or this is a thing which is telling about this interactions between the objects okay now we'll look into okay i will just try to motivate you with some of the recent works what we have done okay in this particular and as i said that uh, though in image i do a lot of works in medical image processing but when you look into the video uh, this is the problem which we are working we started with the problem of human action recognition but rather we saw that there are very less amount of work in the in the in the sports analytics okay implementing implementing the machine learning and deep learning techniques so these are the two recent works which we have done one has been published in the in the one has been uh, published in the cvpr workshop in 2019 where our group has first proposed okay a particular efficient technique which is which is basically a graph network and then the graph features gets into the gets into a learning model right and 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 this particular network, this particular network can actually give you the ball position statistics in a soccer game in the real time. We improved our technique, okay, in terms of we made a more, more robust graph. Okay, we can now not only can associate the players with the ball, but we can also find the groups of the players, okay, in a particular team. Right? And we can try to find that in not only the ball position statistics, but we can also try to find that the positional positional advantage of a team compared to the to the location of the ball and the and the players of the other team, right? And this is a very 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 good work which recently got published in the in the pattern recognition journal, and 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 this also this also is based on the flow network. First, we generate a particular dynamic graph. And dynamic graph we define the nodes in terms of the players in terms of the of the of the players and the ball and then we try to try to associate the nodes and disassociate the nodes uh, okay considering whether the ball is being is being coupled with a player or the ball is in the open space or the ball is coupled with another another opponent player or the player of the same particular uh, same particular team so depending on where the ball is moving whether it is in the position of the uh, whether the ball is being uh, pushed for the pass, whether the ball is in the vacant land, or whether the ball is with uh, with another particular position, we try to define the different uh, nomenclature of the nodes and different uh, features gets updated of the nodes, right? And those features of the nodes are being are being used to train a particular network, right? And that network behaves as a classifier. Okay, so these are the good uh, the two works which, if you are interested. Uh, to 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 connect with us, uh, okay. You can surely do that, right? And in the conclusion, what I can say is that, uh, okay, the this is a very interesting domain of of uh, uh, machine learning and deep learning, of course. Okay, so understanding the spatio-temporal information is the key. Uh, there are a lot of activities going on how we can fuse the spatial and the temporal domain information right and what that how we can apply to different domains of applications right obviously performance versus processing cost is a trade-off as we know this is always a, a trade-off in the in the deep learning techniques right how much quality i can get and how much resource i require how many whether i can make my uh, uh, model a lot okay a lightweight model people are now trying to uh, trying to work with uh, video analytics which can be very lightweight so so model completion right using the less training data uh, can we perform something transfer learning type of technique? So these are these are all the things which are now coming in a great way in this particular domain, so that the performance and the processing cost trade-off can be handled, right? Last but not the least, I just want to tell you that this is um, this is that as this is an IEEE program, 
right? That means as, as Professor Selina also knows that I am a very, a very, a very strong volunteer of IEEE in in the, in in my country and also in the in Southeast Asia. Uh, this is an IEEE blending learning program which is being uh, which has been developed by me for IEEE, and this is a machine learning program which will be coming very soon. And I hope that you all will enjoy it once it comes to the IEEE platform. And these are the things which I will be covering. And this will be again coming up with the next uh, uh, okay, next stage or the, or the next course of deep learning is also on the pipeline. So I hope that IEEE will give me the opportunity to, to work with IEEE and to contribute to the IEEE uh, for the student, for the research communities and for the professionals in the, in the best possible way. And I thank you all.